The thick fog that clung to Los Angeles made searching for the girl who was going to kill herself slow and uneasy. But in the end, I'd have settled for that and more. Because murder happened twice before I found the lady in Mink. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Lady in Mink. By Pacific Coast time, it was only five o'clock in the afternoon. But the dense, billowing fog that was heavy over everything, like a huge, thick hand, said it could be midnight. And Los Angeles could be London in May, December. So when I got out of my car and walked toward the fuzz of red neon that marked the hotel cocktail lounge where I was to meet my new client, Grace Tyler, I felt all alone and a little sorry that I wasn't in some nice, cozy nine-to-five business that would leave me heading for home now. And maybe an evening with people who like to laugh. But when I was inside the lounge, which was imitation hunting lodge and friendly, I perked up some. My client was young and almost pretty, with dark shingled hair dressed in somber gray and wore not enough makeup. Her eyes were swollen and red from crying. When I introduced myself, she tried to come right to the point. Mr. Marlowe, I I have to find my sister. She... (laughs) Oh, take it easy, honey. That won't do it. Who is your sister? I'm sorry. It's all right. Her name is June Drake, Mr. Marlowe, and she's in trouble. Mm -hmm. I got this letter from her. Here. Yeah. Trapped, no way out, take my own life. Hateful people, this is to say goodbye. <laughs> Who's this Melnick she mentions? Do you know him, Mrs. Tyler? No, I, I never heard the name Melnick before. I'm Miss Tyler. Oh. My sister was the married one, Mr. Marlowe. Her husband was Stu Drake. He died a few years ago. I see. Have you been to the police with this? No, because... Well, you see, Mr. Marlowe, June is... She's different. More full of fun than I am, and, well... She gets around, and sometimes the strange people, dangerous ones. Yeah, I think I know what you mean. Grace, what does your sister look like? Well, she's about my height. Has long red hair, and she's pretty, Mr. Marlowe. Very pretty. Mm. Aside from her looks, anything else? Car, clothes? Clothes, yes, definitely. She always dresses well, except that she's overly fond of furs. Most of the time, she wears a mink stole. Stole, huh? Kind of a cape? Yes, it is. I see. June has an apartment in Beverly Hills, Mr. Marlowe. 3,300 wrecks for drive. Mm -hmm. I went there, but it was locked. The neighbors say she left for New York a week ago, and yet I... I... Yet she couldn't have because this letter was mailed here in town only yesterday. Is that it? Yes. Oh, please, Mr. Marlowe, do something. Here, here's $50. I'll pay more if only you'll hurry. Oh, that'll do it. Where can I get in touch with you, Grace? I'm staying here at the Beverly Crest Hotel. I don't live in Los Angeles. Well, as a starter, I think I'll try number 3,300 wrecks for drive. I'll call you later. Goodbye, Grace. Outside, the fog felt about the same. But there was more of it, so I was 15 minutes getting to June Drake's apartment, which was a ground floor arrangement. Artie in about the size and shape of the ale bowl. I was only half that time outsmarting the cheap lock on the back door, drawing all the blinds shut inside, and turning on a single light. But then I was no place. There were clothes in the closets, prettier ones in the bureau drawers, and it went on like that for 45 more minutes. Everything just as it should be and no lead. Until I was ready to leave. Then on a coffee table, I saw something that stood out in that nest for the idle rich, like an ear-to-ear grin on an undertaker. It was a book of matches advertising Duke Gray's Billiard Academy, third in Maine, where particular pool players congregate. (laughs) That and the name Melnick had to dovetail or I was licked. The next hour was a lucky one. I found the Duke himself for both new and despised Melnick, whom he described as a hardly ever sober, dirty word, front name Frank, who lived third floor rear at the Palace Arms, a tired walk-up also on Main Street. So at exactly nine o'clock, I walked the length of a filthy corridor, stopped and knocked the knuckles on my right hand almost raw before the door inched open. And a pair of shifty eyes and a puffy, pasty face blinked out at me. Yeah? What do you want? 
If you're Frank Melnick, conversation. I'm not dressed for it, honest. This isn't a social call. Mr. Melnick! Hey, what do you think you're doing shoving your way into my room? Who do you think you are? Name's Marlowe. I'm looking for June Drake. June Drake? I don't know any June Drake. Honest. You don't convince me, Melnick. Now shake the fuzz off your brain and start remembering or you'll find yourself in trouble up to your eyebrows. Okay, okay, I know her. When'd you last see her? Three weeks ago. Maybe a month ago. But she's an acquaintance from my hometown, that's all, honest. You're a liar. June Drake would brush you off like a piece of lint and you know it. Listen, I'm as good as she is any day. Don't, don't forget that. Get your hands off me, Melnick. Now get out of here. Go on. I told you it. once, Melnick, let go. <clears throat> okay, now start talking. Give it to me straight the first time or I'll get real mad. Come on, get up. Okay. There's a guy named Jaffe, Hugh Jaffe. He's June's boyfriend. That's all I know. Honest. All right. What's this stuff? These clippings and these pictures here. I used to be a photographer. Honest. Until your lens got bloodshot, huh? Yeah, on the Salinas Herald Star. All right, Melnick. What's Hugh Jaffe's address? It's 2001 North Beachwood Drive. Thanks. I'll try it. But if you're not telling me the truth, Melnick, I'll be back. Honest. <laughs> Yes? You want what, senor? I, uh, Mr. Hugh Jaffe. He is not here. I am Margarita Jaffe, his wife. What do you want with him? A few words, Mrs. Jaffe. Do you expect him soon? Since he does not live here anymore, no. Oh. You and Hugh are divorced, then. Eh? I didn't know that. And I did not say that. Now, what are you looking for? June Drake. Ju what do you want to know about that? I want to know where that is. Can you help me? No, I cannot. I do not know and I do not care. But when you find her, senor, I hope you find her dead. If I'd have followed the approved technique, I'd have lost a leg on the lady's threshold. And I was about to lean on a doorbell again to try once more for an address on Mr. Hugh Jaffe when I saw I didn't need to because stuck over the mailbox was a letter forwarded to him at 41 Peacock Lane, Brentwood, California which was a half-hour drive due west of Hollywood. Thirty fog-filled minutes later, Hugh Jaffe and I exchanged introductions, and I stated my purpose. Then I stumbled behind him through a two-inch thick rug that ended in an oak panel library, where he cigared me, then settled back and waited. We looked at each other until it became embarrassing. Then he opened. Well, oh, I wish I could help you, but I haven't seen or heard of June Drake in over three weeks. Well, I was under the impression that you two were on closer terms, Mr. Jaffe, if you don't mind my mentioning it. Not at all. He used to be, but all that's changed now. She was too expensive for me. A lovely creature, but terribly vain. Now that she's out of the picture, you're going back to your wife. No, huh? I'm not. Frankly, Marlowe, uh, my, shall I say, infatuation for June has completely destroyed everything Margarita and I ever had. Which I suppose makes divorce the next step? <laughs> sure, I wish it were that easy. She refuses to give me a divorce, Marlowe. Her way of striking back. Yeah, I know what you're getting at. I had a brief chat with Mrs. Jaffe myself. Well, if you uh, hear from June, get in touch with me, will you? I'll appreciate it. Of course. I'll be happy to help in any way I can. And please, Marlowe, uh, call me if you find her, hmm? Number here is Crestview 89122. Yeah, I'll remember it. Even if I find her dead. Dead? What do you mean? Why that? Well, from where I stand, Mr. Jaffe, June Drake is dynamite. And that stuff can blow up right in your face, huh? When you least expect it. Good night. Sure, it was double talk, but sometimes swinging wide and praying for a lucky punch beats waiting in your corner. Besides, that was as far as I could go on the book of matches. So after slowly walking a block through the chilling fog, I found a phone, called my client, and brought her up to date on the Jaffe Triangle and my own contention that if June Drake didn't try actually to kill herself, Senora Margarita Jaffe might. That grace wouldn't buy. No, no, Mr. Marlowe, I, I, I can't believe that. Well, maybe you just don't want to. But either way, there's still Frank Melnick. <laughs> We've already met Grace, and believe me, he's got all the charm of a black widow spider. What does this Melnick do, Mr. Marlowe? I mean, what work? Yeah, he's a drunk. He used to be a photographer for some paper, the uh, Salinas Herald Star. Salinas? Yeah. Why, Mr. Marlowe June used to live in Salinas when she was married to Stu Drake. You sure, Grace? Positive. Grace, how did June's husband die? Stu? Yeah. He was killed in a car wreck. Drove it over a cliff. Mm -hmm. June just got out and 
Maybe. What do you mean, maybe, Phil? Well, you might as well face it, honey, because the chances are slim that that's the whole story. What? Look, Grace, suppose... Well, suppose something else happened, like... Like June being responsible for Stu's death. Oh, no. Yeah, and Melnick, the photographer, with a picture to prove it. You know, a small case of blackmail. Oh, no. No, Phil, you're wrong. She wouldn't kill. I know that okay, she would Okay, okay. She's your sister, honey. I'll, I'll do the dirty guesswork for both of us until we get some proof. And right now, that makes back to the hacienda of one Senora Jaffe my best bet. Because the lady there is both jealous and hot-tempered. A daily double that always runs in the money. So long, baby. I got back to my car and pointed to the 2001 North Beachwood Drive again. I was feeling pretty low because no matter which way I added things, June Drake always came out a minus, which wasn't good. The sometimes lady had a real sweet sister. But then I told myself it was still the fog making the good look better and the bad worse. And to concentrate on my driving and the facts I had to go on. When I did just that, I took my foot off the accelerator and slammed it down onto the brake hard. And it suddenly occurred to me that I was going the wrong way. Because if I was right about Frank Melnick being a blackmailer and June Drake a killer, the senora would keep a lot longer than the drinking man in the Palace Arms third floor rear. I was only three quarters of an hour getting back down to Main Street, but even as I started up the foul-smelling rickety stairs, a small voice inside kept telling me that I was too late. But a second later, as I moved quietly toward Melnick's door, two other voices, not so small, and coming from the room in question, said otherwise. Said that Melnick was still around and as healthy as ever. But better than that, that his guest was the lady my client was paying me to find. A lady named June Drake. All of which made this a good time for my right hand and the thirty-eight in my pocket to get together while I listened carefully. Then moved closer until I was next to the door. Oh, an empty gin bottle. What was that? I don't know. Outside in the hall. Open up, Melnick, before I blast my way in. Come on. Marlowe, get out of here, Jim. Okay. okay, wise guy, wait a minute. For what? The lady's exodus, I warned you, Melnick, get back. Hey! Hey, what's the matter with you? What are you doing? Looking for June Drake, remember? Now, where is she? What are you talking about? I'm alone in here. Yeah? You always talk to yourself in a high voice, don't you? That window to the fire escape there is always open on foggy nights, too, isn't it? Listen, smart guy, I want to know where she... Wait a minute, the sneak stole here. Maybe it doesn't matter where she went. Maybe she'll be back after she thinks I'm gone. I don't think so. You see, Mr. June Drake never left. She's right behind you, stupid. In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, you'll find both pleasure and a chance for profit when you listen to Sing It Again, CBS's hour-long Saturday night cavalcade of melody, riddles, and prizes. Your chance for the greatest prize in radio, $53,000. When Sing It Again comes your way over most of these same CBS network stations later tonight, be sure you're listening. 53000 It might be yours. Now, with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Lady in Mink. Maybe June Drake had used the spiked heel of a shoe, maybe the butt of a pistol, but either way, it didn't matter because on the way to the floor, I'd bounced once off the sharp corner of an end table and... This was why all the lights in the world had gone out for me at once. Hours they blinked on again one at a time, and I dragged myself hand over hand along the length of an iron bedpost until I was standing. I saw there was blood oozing from a cut on the right side of my face. But as the two rooms focused into one again, I forgot about the slightly battered Marlowe and concentrated instead on an open newspaper lying at my feet. Because written across it with an eyebrow pencil and firm but feminine hand were the words, Grace, call off your private detective. It's too late to help me. I'm near the end. But before I go, I'm going to take the two people with me who have wrecked my life. Goodbye, June. At that, I started for the door in a hall phone to call the police. But then I stopped. Conscious for the first time of the half circle of hushed, gaping faces and bathrobes that stood in the doorway. The gaping faces that weren't turned toward me, but over to a shadowed corner where, face down in a pool of his own blood, was the dead form of Frank Melnick. In the middle of his back, an ice pick. Red to the hilt. Lieutenant 
Ibarra's office. Sergeant Mooney speaking. Marlo Mooney, where's Ibarra? He had to go out of town. Oh. Well, look, Mooney, I'm at a place called the Palace Arms on Main near 4th. Third floor rear, there's a man named Frank Melnick with an ice pick in his back. Very dead. Know who he is, Marlo? Yeah, an ex-newspaper photographer. A drunk and, I think, a blackmailer in reverse order. Any idea who did it? Uh-huh. One June Drake. A red-headed lady in mink. Was out to kill herself just as soon as she tidies up her affairs a bit, which I think includes killing again. So if you'll put out a call for her, the mink, by the way, is a cape. The lady, young and about 5'6", I'll try to get to what I think is her next stop before she does. Call you later. When I got through to my client and broke the news, she gasped and kept repeating no in a small, strained voice that kicked at the lining of my insides no matter how fast I talked. So in one breath, I told her that I was going first for Margarita Jaffe, then her husband, either of whom could be next on June Drake's final agenda. Then I gave her the Crestview phone number that Hugh Jaffe had given me. Told her to call me there in an hour, hung up and ran for my car in 2001, North Beachwood Drive. Feeling punk. It was a minute better than midnight when I got there, and it was ten wet, dripping minutes more before the door finally opened. A hatchet-faced housekeeper with a stocking on her head said that Mrs. Jaffe had left a half hour ago, saying something about meeting a woman. And the housekeeper would have said more, but I was already back in my car heading for Brentwood in number 41, Peacock Lane. There, the Oriental houseboy said the boss man was busy playing poker in the den. In something stronger than Esperanto, I made it clear that my business was more important. A minute later, a door opened on the far side of the room. Excuse me, gentlemen. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. <clears throat> Well, aren't you working a little late tonight, Marlowe? Murder isn't always done during office hours, Mr. Jaffe. Murder? Yeah, with a nice pick at that. Tell me, have you heard from your wife or June Drake tonight? No, of course not. Why do you ask? Because June Drake just killed a man named Melnick. Killed a man? Why, that... That's what, Mr. Jaffe? That's hard to believe. Why? Because it was a man? What were you expecting? Don't be absurd, Marlowe. I was expecting nothing like this at all. It's a shock to me, it... Yeah, excuse me. I'll take it myself, Jung, in the dining room. Be with you in a minute, Marlo. All right, Mr. Jaffe, make it fast, will you? Love to listen on telephone. Joan, listen to me. You don't know what... Wait a minute. There's a private detective here. I think he's listening in on the extension. It doesn't matter anymore. Nobody can stop me now, Hugh. I... I'm leaving tonight. I only call to let you know that you don't have to worry anymore, that I won't be any... Never mind that. Any... Where are you, June? Tell me. I'm Try to do anything, Hugh. It's too late. Much too late. Goodbye. Hmm. Pretty talkative. Well, you heard that, didn't you? Yeah, I heard it all right. You heard that too, didn't you? And I didn't like it, Jeffy, so... Oh, don't bother. This one's mine. I'm expecting it. Hello? Hello, I wanted... Oh, is that you, Marlo? Yeah. Look, Grace, your sister just called and... Oh, well, it doesn't look too good, honey. Oh, Grace called here. Oh, but Phil, where is she? Do you know? Is she all right? No, no, she isn't, Grace. What? Any way you look at it. Now, tell me, where are you? Oh, at my place, the Beverly Crest Hotel. All right, now stay there. I'll talk to you as soon as I can, Grace. Goodbye. Oh, but where are you going? Thanks for your cooperation, Jeffy. It's been a lot of help. I'll also talk to you as soon as I can. Believe me. I got outside, piled into my car, and took off. I didn't know if I was racing to keep a mixed-up girl from committing suicide or going after a murderer who was scheduled to kill again. I was 20 precious minutes following the wriggle at Sunset Boulevard from Brentwood to Santa Monica, where it hits into US-101 that parallels the Pacific. And out there with the fog even thicker, I was 20 minutes again finding the Ocean Way Hotel. The landlady there was a fat henna blonde with a mouthful of gold and foul language. And she said that she never heard of a June Drake until I lied that I was an L.A. cop described the girl as a lot of red hair flowing over a mink's toe who could be using any name. Then she told me that what I called June had just been a woman visitor a little while ago. At that, we started down a short corridor to a rented room, fast. I, I wouldn't do this for no one but a cop. Brother, believe me, we both better be talking about the same girl. Raising a fuss at this hour of the night. It's the room there. No light on. I thought you said she had a visitor. Maybe the visitor went home. What do you expect? Two o'clock in the morning. Mm, not a peep. Come on, open it up. Open it up. Now he tells me. He's got my keys over on the other side in my room. 
Okay, and then we'll get in the hard way. You who cut it out, you'll bust my door. Take it easy, Blondie. You're in for a shock. Oh, okay, turn the lights on. Oh. That, that's the woman that visited her. Yeah. Spanish woman known as Margarita Jaffe. Ice pick and all. I better get a little air over here by the window. I don't feel so good. Yeah, and I better get to a phone and... Hey, there's a cigarette over there. It's still smoldering. She may not be very far away. Brother, you said a mouthful. Come here and look. What is it? What do you oh, see? Right there. Near the pier under that street lamp. Ain't that the one you're after? Where? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Red hair and mink stolen She's seen us. Right out to the end of the pier. Yeah, she's running. Call the cops. Blondie, sit tight. Yeah. I'll see you later. <laughs> the time I got out to the street and across the way we'd seen her, she was already out onto the pier. I caught one glimpse of her red hair and then nothing but the fog that swallowed her up like she was made of smoke. I ran toward the spot where she had disappeared and tried to yell over the crash of the waves for her to come back when I heard it. <laughs> After that, things happened fast. From somewhere, the cop on the beat, then Blondie, then a couple of scared kids who'd been necking in a car, and then more. <laughs> I knew it. Oh, I knew it. I saw her pass me a couple of minutes ago. Dressed too nice. I should have stopped her. Mr. Mr. Chijump? Yeah. Officer, oh. shine your light over there, will you? I thought I saw something move. Oh, okay, but in this fog, we won't be able to see much. Besides, with those waves in the undertow around here, she hasn't got a chance. Maybe not. You never can tell. Huh? Hey, hey, move the light over a little. To your left. Yeah, that's it. There on the piling. I don't see nothing there. Just a greasy pole. And... Now, here, look. On that cross piece near the water line on the piling. Was that hers? Yeah, that was hers, all right. What is it, mister? That blondie's a very valuable fur. A stole made of mink. I never could figure where people came from at three o'clock in the morning when something nasty happened. But they always do. Some come to help, some just to stare, and others maybe to see if they can take it. An hour after I'd heard June Drake scream, we'd found nothing but the stole. I couldn't take any more. Maybe it was still the fog. Maybe maybe it was the thought that in a hotel room up in Beverly Hills, a sweet kid named Grace Tyler was waiting to hear from me. And I knew that sooner or later I had to call her. I lit a cigarette and started to walk across the ocean way in the nearest phone. But then, just as I was about to enter the hotel lobby, I stopped. And slowly turned back toward the pier in the swirling cloak of ocean-covering fog crazy thought seeping into my mind like an ever-widening circle of ink into a white blotter. Until finally there was nothing but dark. I made my call to Grace and told her to get downstairs into a taxi and over to police headquarters where we had a long story to tell. An hour later... We were sitting in Ibarra's office, and Sergeant Mooney knew what had happened from the time I had first met Grace at 5 o'clock that afternoon. Well, Marlowe, looks like June Drake meant what she said in that note. She took care of Melnick, Mrs. Jaffe, and then herself. Did they recover the body before you left? No, Sergeant, they didn't. And I don't think they will. You mean the undertow? No, I don't. I mean something a little more treacherous. What are you saying, Phil? That this whole thing was a frame, Grace... The interested parties, Hugh Jaffe and your sister, June. The object, get rid of the difficult Mrs. Jaffe. The means, have June Drake kill her without keeping her intentions much of a secret, and then have June Drake pretend to kill herself. The result, the police never bother looking for June Drake, and when all is forgotten, June and Hugh Jaffe get together in some other city under some other name. Oh, no. No, Phil, I don't believe that. I don't believe any of this. I can't. I won't. I don't feel... Hold it, please, Uh, Miss Tyler. I'm sorry. Go on, Phil. Well, this part's a guess at the moment, but I think it'll hang together. Mrs. Jaffe wouldn't give Hugh a divorce. Jealousy? Yeah, that and one idiosyncrasy. The Senora was crazy about money, and since he was doing the running around, a divorce would cost him much more than he was willing to pay. Which means that although Miss Tyler here hired you, you fell into the stellar role of the patsy, the Mm. star witness. Would always be close enough to later tell a story they wanted told, but never close enough to actually catch June Drake, who... Has already murdered twice tonight. Right. Then, Marlowe, big question. Where is June Drake now? That is something I worked on all night. And I almost had the answer once. I almost caught June at Melnick's flat in the Palace Arms because I surprised her. She thought I was going to Mrs. Jaffe's house at the time, but I changed my mind. Remember, Grace? What? Oh, you must remember, baby. 
you were there. You're June Drake. Well, Phil, now that we've picked up Hugh Jaffe and it's all over, I still don't see how you actually knew that Grace Tyler and June Drake were one and the same. I was lucky, Mooney. When Grace called me at Hugh Jaffe's house right after she called as June, I heard a bell buoy in the background over the phone. But I didn't think much about it at the time. Yet Grace claimed to be at her hotel in Beverly Hills. It wasn't until I began to think of the whole thing as a frame that everything fell into place. The clues planted so I couldn't miss them all the way down the line. The book of matches, the mink, the red hair was a fall. And another thing, Mooney. Hugh Jaffe was much too surprised when I told him that June Drake had killed Melnick, a man. He expected the murder of his wife, Margarita. Well, why did June kill Frank Melnick? Because he was blackmailing her. You see, Melnick knew that June had murdered her first husband. June was stuck. She couldn't let her future husband know what had happened to her past one. So she included him in as victim number two. (laughs) Besides, that's the only final payment she can ever make to a blackmailer. Mm Mm-hmm. Then, Marlowe, June Drake is the real person that never actually was a sister named Grace Tyler, was it? No. No, I guess there never was a Grace Tyler. Ever. Good night, Sergeant. Outside, it was that strange time between the end of one night and the beginning of the day that follows. When I looked up, I could see that the thick, heavy fog that had been with me ever since I'd first met the woman called Grace Tyler was lifting, breaking apart, so that here and there it was only thin, spiraling wisps above which there was the pale, gray promise of a nice tomorrow. As I walked along, it seemed to me that There was less and less fog, until by the time I'd gone a few blocks, I was sure that I could feel fresh air, cold against my face, and clean. I figured I might walk until the sun came up. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Lynn Allen, Lillian Bayef, Edgar Barrier, Whitfield Connor, Anne Morrison, Lou Krugman, and Jimmy Eagles. The special music is by Richard Orant. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... An iron skull was their trademark. Their business was climbing walls, and it was all done on wheels at 70 miles an hour. But that was a cinch for the death cheaters until they felt murder with a feminine touch. Sunday is a day when CBS brings you the tops in comedy, but it's also a day when you'll find big-hearted Danny Clover patrolling the Great White Way. Broadway is my beat, says Danny Clover, and every Sunday he brings you a new adventure along the main stem. On CBS Sundays, you'll also find Dashiell Hammett's one and only Sam Spade cutting another of his famous capers. Broadway is my beat, and the adventures of Sam Spade are regular Sunday features on most of these same CBS network stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Now, stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.